the plan for today is to go over the lecture slides. You might have seen that I also posted a problem set so that you can do some hands-on stuff if you would like to. So it essentially asks you to start from a basic RBC model that allows for simulation and then to do some data treatment and actually estimate a model and have a look at diagnostics. So what I didn't do yet is schedule a Q&A session. And probably it would be a good idea that if you feel the need for that, so if you would like to discuss or talk more about that, you drop me a note in the MetaMouse channel and then we will try to arrange for something. Does that sound like a plan? Yes, it's OK. okay. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is full information estimation of the SGE models. You already saw the nonlinear estimation. Here we're going to do the basics of the linear estimation. So essentially the stuff that happens before the things that Frederick showed you. So in terms of content, we're going to start with an with the structure of an estimation mod file. So I'm going to quickly show you the typical Dynair syntax that you're usually using. And then we're going to talk a bit more about what Bayesian estimation means and why you might want to use it and what's at least partially happening in a background um, in terms of posterior sampling. So what the Metropolis Hastings algorithm does, things you should be looking for if you work with it and also some of the diagnostics that is usually involved if you're estimating a model. So one of the issues I'm having is that I don't really know the background of people, whether you have estimated models before, so whether we should look more at the theory, more at the hands-on stuff, more the basic contents or more advanced topics. So we probably have to figure that out on the fly, whether this, the level is too high or too low. The past times I taught this material, there was a, somewhat of an issue with very diverse backgrounds. Hopefully everyone will take something out of this. Okay, so if you consider a standard file for simulating a model like Michel's stochastic simulation files, if you want to estimate such a model, what of course you need to specify is which parameters you want to estimate. So the goal of estimation is always find values for the parameters. And you do that with an estimated params block. And you can do that for structural parameters like row G, which is an auto regressive coefficient. And for example, also for standard errors, correlations and stuff like that. And you can estimate a model either with Bayesian techniques, which will usually mean that you need to specify a prior distribution because Bayesian means there will be a prior, more on that later. Or you could do it with just maximum likelihood. So without a prior. If you do maximum likelihood, then this block will look different. You will just provide a starting value for the parameter, no distribution. So no beta PDF or something like that. That's how you switch between maximum likelihood and Bayesian estimation by specifying within that block whether there are prior distributions or no prior distributions. Note, you cannot mix it. You cannot have prior distributions for some parameters and no prior distributions for other parameters. It's either fully Bayesian or not Bayesian at all. Then, of course, if you're trying to estimate a model, then clearly, you need to specify the observables because estimation means you want to find parameters given observed data. So the var ops statement followed by the names of the variables specifies which variables are observed. And this statement is used in various contexts. So if you do identification, something Willy will talk about, this is also the statement that tells Dynair which variables you can observe. Oh, and by the way, in case you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. So this part here is the minimum. This needs to be specified before you can estimate. Then you need a command to estimate the model using full information techniques, run things like the Kalman smoother. That would be if given all of the data, you want to know 
what are unobserved state variables or shocks that would be running a Kalman smoother and to analyze things like impulse responses, moments, or generate forecasts. The respective command is just estimation. The required input is a data file. You need to tell the program what's the name of the file where the observables you just specified here are stored. So that is the minimum. And then you can provide various other options that are optional. So what I did here, I specified mode check. We will see plots like this. This is for checking whether the mode of your estimation truly is a mode. You should probably never run an estimation without that command. This here, mhreplic, specifies the number of replications in your chain. I will tell you or show you later on what that means. This here is the number of chains. We will also talk about that later on. And then the smoother command tells the program run the Kalman smoother. I don't know whether Michelle already talked about that, Kalman filter and Kalman smoother. Yes, no, maybe. Do you know what that is? What the Kalman filter is? Uh, no, Kalman smoother, no. Uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Karame talked about it uh, this morning a bit. And in his lecture, he discusses, but if you have a time to, to add more, please, you, yeah. I would like to benefit okay. from it, please. So the idea of the, so the problem with estimation of models usually is that we don't observe the state variables. So you saw, I think, in Michelle's lectures that the solution to your DSGE model takes a state space form. So you, the goal of finding a solution to the model is finding a policy rule or policy function for the state variables. You need to know how the state variables evolve over time. The problem is that usually you don't observe all the state variables. For example, capital most of the time is unobserved. And that prevents you from estimating your model directly because you would need to know the unobserved state variables. Filters and common filter is a special case. Particle filters are other ways to do that are a way to observe data and use that data to do inference about the values of the states. Here we are in the world of linear models, linear models with normally distributed shocks. You can show that in that case, the so-called Kalman filter is the optimal thing. That's the best filter you can use. And essentially the idea is like in a regression. You observe observables, you have a guess what your state might be. Given your state, you do a prediction on your observables. And that prediction for the observables, you compare with the actual realization. So you will see, given my state, I made a mistake in the forecast for my observable. And based on that forecast error, you adjust your estimate for your states. So like say you think capital is low, but you see output is high. Given that output is high, but based on capital being low, you predicted output to be low, you know that this forecast error in output that you underestimated it most likely implies that capital is actually higher. And the common filter gives you a precise way of updating your estimate about the states based on observed information. And the Kalman smoother is then the next step because what the Kalman filter tells you is observable. So let's say you observe a variable today. Then the question is, what is your best guess of, with filtering for capital today? But sometimes you're interested not in what is your best guess for a state variable today, given information today, but rather given that I now observe output, what is my best guess for capital 10 periods ago? So do the question of what is the most likely value of a state variable or a shock given all the information in the sample, not just information observed up to this point. And that's the thing that the Kalman smoother uh, answers. It's using all the data, what's my best guess of what has happened in the data before. So with filtering, it's always up to today. With smoother, it's using all of the data. That's the difference between the two. That's in a nutshell what's going on. And this smoother here will provide you estimates of this, like a value for 
the most likely value for, for example, TFP shocks that happened in your model. And then there's this moments var endo command. What that does is, is it shows you the endogenous moments of the variables given the observed data. And then once you have estimated your model, you know the parameters, and then you want to diagnose whether your estimation was actually successful. And you should do that by using, for example, trace plots. This, I will show you an example of this. This would be generated trace plots for the first chain. And you can also have a look at the so-called autocorrelation functions of your Metropolis Hastings, where so you can look up the syntax. It's documented in the manual. Here it's show the evolution of the chain for the structural shock in chain one for the shock FC. And we'll show, we'll show you how you can actually use this. So you don't need to understand everything now. It's just where later on you can look it up. So we don't always have to switch from the concepts to the Danair syntax. Oh, sorry, I have a question. Sure. Um, in order for us to, to do the estimation of parameters, we need um, uh, observations of, of the observable variables. Yeah. Uh, is it possible uh, for us to also obtain the estimates of these parameters by constructing this time series uh, in Danair? What do you mean with constructing the time series in Dynar? Uh, just uh, just uh, simulating uh, a time series. You could do that, but then obviously the time series is generated with the parameters you selected. Mm -hmm. So if you simulate data and you estimate your model on that data, the parameter values you should obtain if everything's nice identified are exactly the parameters you put in. That I put in the beginning of. Yeah, it. so mm -hmm. that's not going to help you. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not going to be informative. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you implement a mod file, there are th certain things that you need to keep in mind that are harmless if you do simulations, but which will kill you if you do that wrongly with estimation. The most crucial thing is so-called parameter dependence. It's really important that you always keep track of independent parameters in your model. Sometimes there is a parameter relationship. So for example, you should never define a function of estimated parameters as an independent parameter. For example, there is the, in New Keynesian models, you have the slope of the Phillips curve if you linearize. Usually it's, this thing is called kappa. And kappa within standard New Keynesian model is one minus theta times one minus, not pretty, but it works. One minus beta theta over theta. You can see here that slope of the Phillips curve in turn depends on the chival parameter theta and the discount factor beta. What people often do with simulations is they define a parameter kappa before the model block and then set kappa to this value. But that will be problematic if you decide, for example, to estimate theta, because when you estimate theta, you want to know what happens if I change theta. If you hard coded kappa as an independent parameter to a value, then whenever you change theta, kappa will be stuck at the value you set it to. So for that reason, you can or you must not define dependent objects as parameters your estimation routines will be wrong. So your parameter will not be correctly updated. And because of that, your estimation results will be wrong and you won't even get an error message. Because of that reason, you need to keep track of parameter dependence. One of the things is you can use model local variables. So those things with the hashtag operator, the pound operator. For example, you define within the model block gamma x, which is here the net growth rate, uh, gross growth rate of your economy as the product of population growth, one plus N, and one plus X is the per capita growth rate. This will be the overall growth rate of your economy. And this specification tells Dynair, whenever you encounter gamma X, it is composed of N and X. And now if you estimate N or X, it will be correctly updated. And I've seen published papers where people did this wrong. In that case, the estimation results are completely wrong. 
The second way of doing this is use a steady state file to update the parameters or a steady state model plot. In the file I uploaded, that's exactly the way I did it. There you have growth rates, n and x, and within the steady state file, there is a statement that tells the program, okay, that gamma x is this product. In that case also, because whenever you update the parameters, the steady state needs to be recomputed. Dynair will recompute the steady state and update the parameters. So that's important to keep in mind. And because of this constraint or restriction for estimation, I always recommend you to, even with you just do simulations, to never define parameters or composite parameters as independent objects. They're not independent. You should not be specifying them as being independent. There are two questions. Please go ahead. Um, in the case of this uh, hashtag operator, yeah. can, you, can you use it also for parameters that, that are like uh, time dependent or, or is just, or they are fits also across time? Okay. so. Let's put it this way. If something is time varying, it's not a parameter. Well, as soon as there is a T index, it's not a parameter. It's a time varying object. It's called a variable. So, so. this pound operator in terms of Dynair implementation is just text replacement. Whenever Dynair encounters gamma X, it's going to replace it by this thing, which means you can also use it for variables. I can show you an example, probably. So first of all, get rid of Can you see my screen? So the, the browser? Yes. OK, this is my yes. collection of model file examples. And here, maybe I can make it bigger. This is a mod file of the Basel Bandic Econometrica paper. Whenever you have an Euler equation, the Euler equation tells you one is equal to stochastic discount factor times return in expectations. And of course, that stochastic discount factor can look pretty ugly, particularly if you have Epstein's in preferences. What I did here is I defined a stochastic discount factor, so beta times the ratio of marginal utilities, once with this pound operator, so m is the stochastic discount factor. And then whenever there is an Euler equation, like this one here, one needs to be equal to the expected return on bonds multiplied with the stochastic discount factor, I use this M. And that is that's exactly what Lewis just asked. It replaces the variable. That's also something you can do. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. That was indeed my question, but also, uh... In this case, what you are doing is basically not to introduce the this variable m in the uh, when you put like uh, bars, no, the, yeah. vari the variable name. That that is what you. Yeah, what you yeah. I, I should also tell you why that is the case. Look at the, look look at this expression. Yeah. The stochastic discount factor has stuff dated t plus one. Dynair's timing convention. I hope Michelle told you this is whenever there's something t plus one. Or well, actually, each single equation in stochastic context has a conditional expectations around it. Right? You remember that? Yes, yes. Which yes. It means m here, if this were an independent variable, would be defined as the expected value s of time t of this stuff. But in the Euler equation, the expected value is not on the stochastic discount factor, but the expected value is around everything. So the product of stochastic discount factor and return. If you had defined this as a separate variable, what you would have here is the expected value of the stochastic discount factor. And this is something very different than what we have here. Here, it's really the expected value of the product. If you define it as a separate variable, it's the product of the return times the expected value of the discount factor. And you can get around this timing convention by not defining it as a separate variable. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, it's indeed quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. So whenever you do Epstein's in, you actually need this. There's a second question. 
Okay. Um, my question is related to, uh, for example, the gamma x you defined earlier. Yeah. Can we also define it in the uh, in the uh, steady state block rather than using the? Uh, yeah, sure. Those are what? those two options are equivalent. Now the thing is, there are sometimes cases where I can show you another example. There are cases where you don't really have a steady state or not you don't have an explicit steady state file. So let's take the standard New Keynesian model from Gali, chapter three. In this case, the model is linearized. So all steady states are zero. Usually here, you wouldn't even specify a steady state file. Or sometimes you have cases where you don't provide an analytical steady state, but rather you just provide initial values. In all those cases, you cannot really use a steady state file because you won't be using it. There you need the hashtag operate. That's what I do here. Because there is no steady state model block or steady state file. But generally those two things are equivalent. Further questions? Uh, sorry, it, it, it is uh, something related to it. Can you explain us the purpose of long name and name, please? What are their purpose in the mod file, please? Oh, um, you mean in the one I uploaded? Uh, no, the, just the name. In the mod file, you might uh, sometimes you write name and you write the name of the equation. After that, you write long name equal um, to. Okay. Uh... Long name for for example yeah, here you wait have a second. long name. I I show you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, in in your previous example, the uh, the parameter kappa and theta, is it correct to only estimate kappa in the mod file and infer the the theta from the estimates of kappa? No. Generally, the answer is no, because the, there are cross equation restrictions. The theta will potentially appear in other equations as well. And the program needs to know that if you change theta, it's going to affect other places. Now, there are cases where stuff only shows up in the form of kappa, nothing else. Then it's fair, it's fine to just estimate kappa if there is a one-to-one -one relationship, but often that is not feasible. Mm, okay, okay. Like in my small DSG model, I only have the IS curve, NKPC, and the Taylor rule. So I, I think that that's fair. Yeah, in those cases, if there's just this, um, actually it depends. If there is beta showing up somewhere else, then you might have a problem. Uh, like, like, like what problem? That, so I, okay. Uh, which screen are you currently looking at? Not MATLAB, okay. You can see this here. You have kappa. Kappa shows up in the Phillips curve, right? Mm -hmm. But beta enters kappa. So beta enters the Phillips curve as well. Now, lambda, Oh, sorry, I'll take kappa here. Oh, sorry, in my case, uh, the slope is lambda. This lambda is a function of theta and beta and here even that omega. So there's a whole bunch of parameters. Forget about this omega here. Just say lambda consists of theta and beta. So if you observe lambda, you need to know at least beta in order to back out the theta. You can see here beta shows up. Because of that, oh. you also need theta. You need to know theta. If you if this here allows you to estimate beta and you estimate at lambda, you can back out the theta. The problem will show up if this theta shows up anywhere else in your model. So here in my case, this theta sh only shows up in this equation, nowhere else. So in this case, it would be harmless. You could back it out. But there are other cases where this parameter shows up somewhere else, and then you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, got it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now someone has the question: What is the what's this, and what's this? Right? That's the question. 
Yes, it's, it's done. Thank okay. Um, I'll show you. So this is the mod file I uploaded. And this mod file here is made ready for LaTeX output. This here, the second thing is it defines LaTeX variables. So for example, whenever tau shows up, I want it to be a LaTeX tau with an exponent n. And this long name is the full name of, the, of this variable. This is useful because you can, for example, say write LaTeX, then let's say dynamic model. Um, and write LaTeX, and I think it's called parameter table. And now execute this thing. Oh, wait a second. I should also do collect LaTeX files. Oh, sorry. And now execute this thing, RBC text. Oh, in my case, define solution zero. Where is it complaining? I guess I broke something. But I don't know yet what I did, what I broke. Why is it complaining? Oh, there is an end missing. Did you try to run the mod file I provided you? I guess the end is missing. I'll have to update it later. OK, so what I did here is I, comp I defined two commands for providing LaTeX output and one to collect all the LaTeX files into one compilable thing. Do you know what LaTeX is? So, yes. Yeah, OK. So, what happens is when you have this collect LaTeX file, there is this thing called teshbinder.tesh that will show up in your workspace. I'm going to open this outside MATLAB and I'm going to, okay, let's do it this way. And I'm going to compile it quickly. It's going to take him a bit. Okay, and why doesn't it like me? This is the output you're going to get. This is my parameter table. It provides me in a table the parameter names with the Greek LaTeX letters I provided, the values, and the description I put into long names. That's what it does. And then I, I had this write, write LaTeX dynamic model. It provides me the model equations I entered in output. So for example, this here is the law of motion for capital. Kt is equal to one minus delta Kt minus one plus it. And that's usually the way I check all my equations. I hate checking codes. I do that with typeset data code. And you can even do more with this. So for example, you can automatically have Dynair output the figures into this document. Does that answer the question? It's not really related to estimation, but it shows you a very handy feature. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. It was very helpful. Thank you. Anything else? I do have a question, if you want to ask. Sure. Um, so um, I don't really have a well-defined question, but um, I have. Um, I'm wondering, like, when you have um, variables in, in your observables that have a trend, and you uh, typically what you would like to do is to put the model in a stationary form. So you would like to. That's have the, the next slide. Ah, okay, great. Right, the next slide. Uh, Okay, okay. So um, do you want to talk about to talk about it first and then um, yeah, ask probably you hold your question and then okay. And, yeah. okay, so this is the issue of observation equations. I just uh, told you, yeah, you 
provide Daniel with info on which variable you observe, and then you estimate the model. But it's a bit more tricky because when you estimate a model, it's important that you provide a proper mapping from the variables in the model to the observed data. And often they will not coincide. So you have output. And usually the way you write your model down, this is output, let's say, in percentage deviations from steady state or at least from a balanced growth path. So the model variables are almost always stationary. They're not trending. While in the data, you observe trending GDP. So telling the program, estimate my model by pretending that GDP with a trend is the same as GDP without a trend in the model will obviously lead to very wrong results. Rather, you need to make sure that what you feed in as data is, the ver is a very well-defined counter object to what you have in the model. And as I said, the typical challenge is the model contains stationary variables while the empirical data is trending. So there are typical solutions here. You can either use growth rates in the data, which is a first difference filter, and you link them to growth rates in the model. So you define that the observed variable is the log difference in output. And you feed in the same thing in the data, just the difference of logs of output. Potentially, you need to demean it. The second option would be you detrend the data using some filter. And usually, when you do a filter, you're going to get deviations from a trend and then map them to deviations from a balanced growth path in the model. So what people usually think about is, yeah, let's run an HP filter that gives me percentage deviations from a trend and then tell the program, this is my counterpart to, let's say, output from trend. Beware, you shouldn't do that. The HP filter is a two-sided filter. The value at time t is a weighted average of the values in the past, but also in the future, because it's a moving average that looks into both directions. Your model tells you, no, observables at time t are a function of just today's and past state variables. As soon as you use the HP filter in a two-sided way, you're using future information that the model and the decision makers do not have to construct, estimate, uh, to construct data values today. So whenever you use a two-sided filter, you're actually not taking the information set of the decision makers in your model seriously. For that reason, never use a two-sided HP filter. If you want to do something like HP filtering, please use a one-sided HP filter. It's in line there. Of course, the choice of the respective filter crucially depends on, your re on the researcher's underlying trend concept. If you have a look at, I think, the smetz Valdas model, for example, they have permanent TFP shocks. So there is a unit root in the model in the first place. And in that case, it's natural to use a first difference filter because you needed to detrend the model with this unit root in the first place. There are other cases where your model is already written down in a stationary way. And in that case, you might go for a different fit. Yeah, Thomas, you had a question? No, just a following a follow up um, to your fourth bullet point. I think I, I've seen so many paper with like HP filter and yeah, then- uh, For yeah. example, Gabek's uh, behavior in your Keynesian model does exactly that mistake. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, there. It's, it's a common mistake, but you shouldn't do that. So, Pinning down the correct mapping is hard. For those of you who haven't seen it before. Some time ago, I, let's see whether that works. I wrote this paper, you might have seen it. And you can see it has 80 pages. It essentially looks at different ways of bringing your data to the model. And you might, if you go into estimation, you might at least 
partially want to consult. All those things, which the trending version to choose, how to map it, everything's in there. We could probably talk two hours just about this. I leave it at this point because this is mostly menial stuff where while we are going to focus more on, let's say, other concepts that are probably a bit harder to grasp. But in your homework, you have to work with this. So because in the problem set, one of your tasks is actually to take the data. And as it says here, it's per capita variables and tax rates. Per capita variables will have a trend. And your job here is to use first difference filter to map it to the data, to the model variables. So both. You have to treat the data, bring it into first differences, and demean it. And you have to define within your model the demeaned first differences, map this, and then estimate your model. So that's your kind of your homework. Um, yeah. So so yeah. I was the current and um, uh, like some time ago. So it's really helpful. Um, Otherwise, um, I, I I do have still a, the question like if I don't want to to have a trend in my um, shocks in my model or like um, I don't want to have a trend or I don't want to have a unit root um, like I I want the model somehow or the estimation to tell me which uh, which shock is is the responsible for the trend um, for the trend but. You so, need to, as a researcher, in, you need to take a stand on where does the trend come from? Is it deterministic or is it stochastic? It's kind of what you have to do. If you want to be informed about the trend, you need to model it. If you just say, I don't care about the trend, I don't want to explain it, you just filter it out with a filter of your choice and you don't care about it. But as soon as you're trying to explain it with a structural model, you need to model it. So then you're most of the time stuck with unit root with drift. I see. But um, but like even like doing the, the growth rate, like you somehow, even if you detrend, uh, if you have a um, growth rate for your observable equation in your model and in your data, you somehow still like explain this, this positive growth, consistently positive growth rate by, by some particular shop. Yeah. And usually it's productivity or TFP. Yeah, because there's nothing else in that model that could do that. Yeah, so so I have a I have a model with like energy supply and and that could like lead also to like long term growth when you have like increase in energy supply. And that's why I don't really want I mean I kind of want the model to tell me like which one of the two is is uh... so the, the tricky issue is that those models usually don't imply a balanced growth path. Yeah, exactly. And in that case, doing a linear approximation to such a model will be horribly wrong. Yes, yeah, so we are Second. doing this linearly here. Yeah. So yeah. estimating that model with full information methods might be incredibly hard. Model you have in mind. You're, you're so far from steady state, and uh, and so that's why. At some point, you will move arbitrarily far away. So, first thing is even: does it have a steady state? And then the second thing is, if there is this trend, it will move arbitrarily far away from it. And that will make it extremely hard because you need to have a solution technique that works. And then even if you have a solution technique that works, usually the solution is not linear. And in that case, you need to have a particle filter. And then things become really tricky. That's, that's kind of what, why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> learning and particle filtering and uh, all that data. Okay, great. Thank you very much for- You're welcome. Okay, then we have someone asking whether we can have an example of Bayesian estimation of essentially a heterogeneous agent model using the Winberry toolkit. And the answer is no. That would be way too complicated for a summer school. And also probably depending on what you have in mind, even too challenging for Dynair because you, so uh, my co-author, Benjamin Bourne, has this paper where they estimate smetz bauters model in a uh, heterogeneous Asian version. And in that case, you have around a thousand equations. You do not want to do that in MATLAB. You would like to use Julia, most probably. Julia or Fortran or something like that. 
So sorry, but here we can't really help you. In principle, the idea is conceptually simple. So once you have the stationary equilibrium, you enter that into Dynair, which is the hard part. And then estimating it in principle is straightforward because you then have a linear approximation to the laws of motion up to first order. And then everything else goes exactly the same way as we do standard estimation. That is not the hard part. The hard part is to make this run efficiently and solve the heterogeneous solve for the stationary equilibrium of the heterogeneous agent model, which is also not something you can do in Dynair. So the Dynair part of this is easy. The hard part is actually the, the Winberry toolkit, and that is not something we support here. Other questions? OK. so. Conceptually, our log linearized DSGE model, so first order, takes the state space form. So there is the state space, and the problem is usually not all state variables are observed. That's the challenge here. Usually, our solution to this is you use the Kalman filter. It will deal with the unobserved states. So given your observables, it will give you the best estimate of your unobserved states. And because it also gives you the one step ahead forecast errors, it allows you to construct the likelihood function. So you can write down the likelihood of your DSGE model. So this is the result that you get from the Kalman filter, the likelihood of observing your data. So Y capital T is all the data you observe up to time T, given theta, where theta is our vector of parameters. And this YT is the complete history of observables. And usually what you learn in econometrics is the maximum likelihood estimation. What you do there is you try to find the parameters theta that maximize this likelihood function. So you often do that brute force. You take a solver or a maximizer, minimizer, and you try to find this theta that maximizes the likelihood of, of, of observing your data by maximizing this over the parameter. What people nowadays use is the Dubation estimation. Why? Because this likelihood, or doing maximum likelihood, is most of the times infeasible. Why? Because this likelihood tends to be quite a high dimensional object. So what I show you here is a likelihood from an RBC model where I just estimated two parameters, sigma z, the volatility of a TFP shock, and rho z, its autocorrelation. And what you see on the y-axis is the likelihood. You can see that likelihood decreases here in the shock volatility up to the front. And it's going to decrease here, at least in along some direction, if you have a higher persistence. Now, this is for two parameters you get a value for, of the likelihood for each combination, for just two parameters. The smets wouters model has something like 30 parameters. In that case, our likelihood is not something I could graph here because it would be a 30-dimensional object. When you run maximum likelihood, what you're trying to look for is the highest point here. If you look at this, can you tell me where the highest point is? Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? You can see it's clearly not down here, but there are areas of the likelihood function where it's rather flat, where there is not much curvature. So finding the highest point is hard. And remember, this here is for just two parameters in a very simple model. Even for very simple models, this likelihood can be very ill-behaved. It can show hardly any curvature, and it can show many local maxima, which are going to create problems. As a teacher of mine used to say, for more complicated models, you can think of the likelihood as being an egg crate. It has a lot of peaks. And your goal is to want to find the highest peak. Just looking at this, is this higher than this? And keep in mind, if you do Newton algorithms, they are local. They're going to find, bring you to the highest or to the nearest high point, to the nearest maximum, not to the global one, to the nearest one. And that makes it very challenging. That often leads to what Anschaufheide have termed the dilemma of absurd parameter estimates. Namely, that the maximum likelihood estimates you get are often at odds with information from outside of the model. So something, sometimes you get something like the discount factor is 0.9 in quarterly data. 
that would imply that real interest rates are something in the range of 40%. That obviously doesn't make sense. But if you're doing maximum likelihood, this is what the data tell you. Now try publishing a paper where you try to tell your referees, sorry, I estimated my model and the discount factor is 10% per quarter. They will not buy that. They are going to tell you, sorry, your model is crap. Come back when you have fixed that. So what did people do? They moved from maximum likelihood to what's called Bayesian econometrics. In pure concepts or in principle, there is a fundamental philosophical difference between Bayesian and frequentist econometrics. So being Bayesian means thinking about the world in a totally different way. And there are very good reasons to be Bayesian. There are a lot of books on that. Most macroeconomists are actually not Bayesian believers, but rather they're pragmatists. We, most of us actually use Bayesian me methods because they simply work. They allow us publishing papers. That's not the way the world should work, but it's the way the world does work. And it even goes up to the point that people use Bayesian and frequentist techniques in the same paper, which actually in principle is a no-go, but it happens. That shows you that usually we're very pragmatic. Why do we do this? Adopting Bayesian techniques makes our lives easier. Historically, Bayesians were in the minority. Why? Because computing power was just not sufficient to apply their methods. It used to be extremely complicated to do Bayesian econometrics because most of the stuff cannot be really worked out with pencil and paper. Now with modern computing power, that's not an issue. And as I said, there are very good reasons to be Bayesian. Here are just two references if you're interested. One important distinction here is the concept of probability. And you should at least be aware of that. Namely, Bayesian probability is usually associated with degrees of belief or degrees of knowledge about something. How you think that the world works. In contrast, frequentist probability is usually based on features of a hypothetically observed system. Usually what you're talking about there is the relative frequency of events in the long run. So when you talk about null hypothesis testing, you usually say, yeah, that's the likelihood of observing an event like this if I repeated that experiment infinitely often. Does that sound familiar from statistics? Statistics 101? Yes. <laughs> yeah. But then a Bayesian would usually say, yeah, but we don't care about that. We just have one world. We have one, one set of observations. We can't really run that experiment forever. Why should I care about that? So if you look at the statement of there's a 50% probability that a fair coin will land heads instead of tails, then what the Bayesian essentially says, he believes or his beliefs are evenly divided between those two outcomes. While the frequentist says, yeah, if I could flip that coin infinitely often, then it would land on heads 50% of the times. Because of that, frequentist analysis is limited to inference about the relative frequencies of events in the long run. And as I said, this long run is unobservable and not in the interest of researchers' actual interests. And the life of Bayesians is a lot easier because you can, can apply probabilities to anything that can be the subject of belief or knowledge. You can do that for hypothesis, you can do it for statistical parameters, or even you can test full models. If you want to compare models, for frequentists, that's hard. If the models are not nested, you cannot even do a likelihood ratio test. For Bayesians, that's straightforward. Do Bayesian model comparison. That's very easy. So the main difference, okay. yeah. Um, so you kind of um, embed in the Bayesian approach the, the idea also that the um, the parameter could be time varying and so somehow you have a distribution uh, i mean your distribution or you post a distribution of the parameter somehow but it's not time varying it is it's not i mean stochastic I mean, it's, uh, stochastic yeah that's what we're doing now this conditioning set what's the difference between yeah. the two and then you can come back to it so what frequentists do is they estimate a sampling distribution for a parameter remember if you're a frequentist there is a true parameter out there and all the statements that you do is about your estimator. 
it's not about it's not a statement about a true parameter, but rather this thing you use to estimate. And that is not what we care about. We actually care about the true value of the parameter, but we can't really say something about that because all our statements about, are about the estimator. So the distribution here would simulate the observed effect if you had an experiment repeat, repeated an infinite number of times where only a sampling error affects the results. And then you're asking, OK, what should I observe in terms of my estimate? And in that case, the data are the things that carry the uncertainty via the sampling distribution. The parameter has a fixed true population value. And what you typically do is you condition on the parameter. You look at the probability of observing your data given the true parameter. You're not really making statements about the parameter. You're making statements about the data. And if I want to estimate a parameter, that's not really what I'm interested in. And similarly, if you do this null hypothesis significance test, it usually involves testing a hypothesis we don't believe in because we always want to reject the null. We say, oh, the null hypothesis, the parameter is zero. So we're testing a hypothesis we don't really believe because we think that it is not zero. And, and in that case, your p-value gives the probability of an effect assuming that the null is true. But usually, the null won't be true, and that's what we actually hope for. So we rely on, rely on hypothetically repeating an experiment that never occurred. Because conceptually, you say, oh, the null is true, and then what would happen if we do that infinitely often? But because we test this and we want to reject the null, we actually think, no, the parameter is not true. But we nevertheless proceed under the fiction that this non-event had occurred infinitely often. What you can see is already kind of absurd. In contrast, if you're a Bayesian, you make direct probabilistic statements about effects and parameters based on observed data. Usually, you have statements more about the parameter itself. You treat your parameter as being random or uncertain while you condition on the data. You take the data set as fixed, and this is different from frequentists. Frequentists say, oh, the parameter is fixed, so what about sampling the data? While Bayesians do it differently. They say, we condition on the data. I observe my data. What can I say in terms of probability distributions about my parameters? I hope that distinction becomes at least somewhat clear. And now we dive right into the Bayesian stuff. So you already encountered the central object that Bayesians care about, which is the posterior probability. It's the probability of observing the parameters theta that can be a vector, conditional on having seen the data at hand. So once you observe the data, what can I tell about the parameters? That's the object you're interested in. Be aware. That probability distribution, that peer, is a fully fledged probability distribution. So one of the distributions you're all familiar with is the normal distribution, standard normal. So take the standard normal distribution. That's a full density. Of course, being a normal distribution, we can characterize it by two moments, mean and standard deviation. But in general, that posterior distribution has an unknown form. How many moments do you need to know in order to characterize an arbitrary probability distribution? Do you know? Hey, can you repeat the question? You, want, you, you have a probability distribution. You don't know which it is. How many moments do you need to know in order to fully characterize that distribution? Infinite. Yeah. So you need to know all the moments. There are infinitely many of those which is kind of equivalent to knowing every single point of its histogram. So, and that is hard. You're dealing here with an object that is in principle in finite dimensional because you don't really know much about it. And there you can already see why Bayesian econometrics used to be hard because you end up with probability distributions of objects where you often don't have a lot of information about that probability distribution. You need to work with stuff that is incredibly hard to characterize. We will come back to that. Of course, if you know the probability distribution, it's going to allow you a very neat statement. Like a regression indicates that with 90% probability, the fiscal multiplier is within, with, 
between 0 0.3 and 1.5. Note, you make a direct statement about an effect. You're not making a statement about an estimator, like my estimator, if the null is true, is going to fall in that range. No, I'm making a statement about the true estimate or the true parameter, direct probability statement. That's what you're going to get here. Null hypothesis significance testing is not going to give you any like anything like this. Okay. Everything, everyone with me so far? That's the deepest we're going to get into philosophy. Yeah? Yes, it's okay. Thanks. Okay. Now the problem is look at object one or equation one. There is this posterior. It's, an, it's a probability distribution, and we don't know a lot about it. How do I obtain that posterior? And why do we call this Bayesian econometrics? The answer is Bayes' rule. Consider the basic laws of probability. If there are two events A and B, we know the joint probability of A and B occurring is the probability of A happening conditional on B having already occurred multiplied with the probability of B. That's just base rule. And the same, of course, holds if A occurred, occurred first. If you equate the two things, we have base rule, which tells you the probability of observing B given that A happened, is the probability of A occurring given that B happened, multiplied with the probability of B, divided by the probability of A. That's just straightforward base rule, probably high school math, something like that. Now we're going to apply this rule for the case where we want to use some data, yt, to infer a parameter vector theta. Now my, you can compare this. My B is theta, my A is observing the data. So what do we have? The posterior, namely the probability of observing the parameters theta, given that I have the data at hand, is equal to the likelihood of the frequencies, the likelihood of observing my data given the parameters, multiplied by the probability of the parameters occurring. This thing is called a prior divided by the probability of the data happening, which is called the marginal data density. And you can see here- if uh, Sorry, just, yeah? could you um, repeat? I was often in literature confused by the definition of prior. Could you repeat that definition? So I will talk a lot more about what a prior is. All right. For now, it's just this P of theta is a prior. Okay. We just call it that way. This is just, if you plug in for base rule, those objects, this is what you're going to get. Thanks. So this P of theta given Y is called the posterior distribution. This is everything we know about the parameters theta. Once we have seen the data and we will see and non-data information, which is captured by that probability of theta. This prior here is going to incorporate everything we know about theta. But there is one more step here. Let's go to the, this proportionality side. This P of YT is the probability of observing your data. You can see it doesn't depend on theta. We don't care about this object. If you, you want to maximize that posterior density, if we want to estimate this thing, you can basically leave that out. This is a constant. For every theta, this thing will be always the same. So usually in a lot of applications, you just leave this thing out. That's why we have this proportionality. The main thing you need to keep in mind with Bayesian econometrics is really this here, posterior is, is proportional to likelihood times prior. And compared to a frequentist, this prior thingy here is the new part. As a frequentist, you would be working with the likelihood function. Now we say, no, we have to complement it with a prior and we're going to obtain the posterior. So that's what equation five says. So now look at the prior. What is this prior? This P of theta is the so-called prior distribution. It obviously does not depend on the data. No, what is it? It's the probability distribution of our parameters before we have seen the data. It's not depending on the data. Rather, it, is, it incorporates all the non-data information on the parameters that we have. You could now say, yeah, that's bad. I don't know anything about it, but that's mostly not true. 
we start with this dilemma of observed parameter estimates. And I said, yeah, if you get a 10% discount factor per quarter, that's a problem. Why is that a problem? Because we have this prior information where we think, no, discount factors usually should range in, should be in a range of, let's say, 1% or 2% per quarter. That's already the type of prior that you have. The only reason you can say that estimate was crazy is because you have some prior information on what that parameter is most likely to be. So Bayesian econometrics here gives you a formal way of incorporating this information. It's what you think that this parameter is most likely to be before you have seen any data. And really Bayesian econometrics also works in practice quite well because it allows you to select this prior and combine it with the likelihood. And this prior here is going to restrict what the data is allowed to tell you. Because it's going to tell you, so if you say, okay, my prior tells me the likelihood of a 10% interest rate per quarter is zero, then zero for 10% times something is zero. So we're going to say my posterior probability after seeing the data of this factor being 10% is exactly that, namely zero. That's it. This object down here is called the marginal data density or just the data density. You can see it's independent of the parameters. You can treat it as a proportionality constant except when doing model comparison. So we're not going into model comparison, but if you're trying to compare models, then your conditioning is not just on conditional on the data, but also conditional on the model. And then you would have, this is the probability of observing the data given your model. And now you have, if you have two models, you want to compare models, this is the object that interests you because you can compare the probability of observing your data given one model, compared to given another model. And the one that has the higher likelihood of observing your data is also the model you would prefer. It shows you also why Bayesians can very easily do model comparison. They don't need to be nested because there is this object here that allows you to compare models. If you're interested in that, Cope's 2003 textbook, chapter one, covers that in, I would argue, very, let's say, intelligible or uh, accessible ways. Okay, and as I said, the thing you need to keep in mind is this equation says posterior is proportional to likelihood times prior, which also means that we are interested in this object. So we need to take care of those two things. We already know where the likelihood comes from, namely from the Kalman filter. What we're going to have to specify is how do I evaluate that object and what about the prior? So why if, as I told you, there are, so there are many advantages of doing Bayesian estimation. Why did that only become popular within the last, let's say 15 years? And the answer is the computing power is just not sufficient to apply. Why? You can see here this posterior is a full probability distribution. And we don't know anything about it generally. So it's often not analytically tractable. So, and I told you for an unknown probability distribution, in principle, you would need to know infinitely many moments. You could say, okay, let's do it like a normal distribution. I only care about the first two moments. Like macroeconomists often do. We usually look at second moments of our data and that's pretty much it. But even in that case, if you just look at the first two moments, the expected value of the parameters, given the data, that's an integral. And it's an integral with respect to a density. You don't really, you're not able to characterize. If you look at the second moments, the variance of your parameters given theta, so you want to construct confidence bounds, or actually credible sets, more on that later. You again, you need to solve an integral. Working out integrals, of unknown densities is incredibly hard with pencil and paper. So you need to rely on a computer. So that's where you need to, need to know the computer. You need to use the computer. And there is a kind of a straightforward way to do this. Usually we are interested in integrals of that form. You have some function of the parameter and you want to have the expected value, so the average. 
So the integral is hard to do. What can you do? If you had IID draws from the posterior. So you don't know the density, but you're able to sample from it. So essentially, you don't really know how, let's take the normal distribution. You don't know the formula for the Gaussian bell curve. But for some reason, you have access to MATLAB's random number generator. You can draw random numbers from the normal distribution, although you have no clue how that distribution actually looks like to evaluate its density. If you don't know the formula of the normal distribution, you can't do equation eight. But if you have random numbers, you can do equation nine, basically by saying, OK, draw the random numbers, evaluate that G, and take the average. Essentially, this is called or oh, this is called Monte Carlo integration. You replace the integral by an average over draws. So you have replaced the integral by a sum. And if, if, I have, if you have IID draws from that posterior distribution, that is going to arbitrarily well approximate that integral if you have just enough draws. That's kind of the idea. Here. You cannot really work analytically with equation eight, but modern computers allow you to arbitrarily accurately approximate that integral, but just doing random sampling in the computer and taking the average. So how good is this estimate? You can use a central limit theorem to show that that estimator is, is has a distribution like this. So the standard deviation, the variance of that G, over your draws can be estimated by the variance in our Monte Carlo sample. So you take sample, and you can see it decreases, the variance decreases in, in one over S, which means the standard deviation decreases, this so called numerical standard error, decreases in square root of S. If you have four times as many draws, your precision will double, which also tells you that for arbitrary accuracy, you need really a lot of draws. But most of the times, we're, it's still feasible with the computer. But that's here essentially the idea. You do integration in the computer by random sampling. And if you have enough draws, then you can come pretty close to the truth. OK, is that at least that idea so far clear? Of course, we still don't know how to sample, uh, how to do those random draws. But if you had those draws, taking the average is a very easy way of approximating the, the expected value. Any questions so far? OK, before we continue, a bit more jargon. Even if you're not a Bayesian believer, you should at least know some terminology. And the first thing you need to know is what's called a credible set. So take your parameter or some function of the parameter defined over some region that we don't really care about. So what the credible set is, it describes a range for the parameters, which covers a certain percentage of the likelihood mass. So for example, if you take a 90% credible set, then you're saying your, your object of interest, for example, take the fiscal multiplier. So G would be my fiscal multiplier. That's going to depend, of course, on the parameters. A 90% credible set would give me a range of the multiplier that covers 90% probability mass. So with 90% probability, my fiscal multiplier is between, let's say, 0 and 1.5. That would be something like this. How many credible sets are there? Is there just one, more than one? Any idea? I think there is more than one. Yeah, there are, usually there are finitely many because your restriction is just, or let's, let me quickly graph this. Take a probability distribution that looks like this. So what we're looking for is any area that covers 90%. It could be this, could also be this. So you cut off 10% here and move them here. So a credible set is generally just going to include 90% mass. Usually, we're not interested in a credible set. We're usually interested in the smallest one, which is the Bayesian equivalent to a confidence interval. So the one that has the smallest support, 
which is usually where most of the mass is concentrated. That's where the most likely parameters are. And this thing is called a highest posterior density interval. So this highest posterior density interval, something like a, take a 90% confident highest posterior density interval, that will be the smallest range of parameter values that covers 90% of all potential outcomes. <coughs> this is typically what you're going to report in papers. If you estimate the Kaiva parameter, you're going to report that your Kaiva parameter is with 95% probability between 0 0.5 and 0 0.9. That's usually the object you're reporting. Why am I telling you this? Because if you write a paper with Bayesian techniques, you must not call it a confidence interval. It's not a confidence interval. A confidence interval would be about your estimate. It would not be about the true Kaiva parameter. As soon as you write a confidence interval, every referee will immediately know you have no clue what you're talking about. So be aware of that. The terminology is different, and you should signal that you know what you're talking about. Otherwise, people will not take you seriously. Also, I've re re refereed countless papers where people say, oh, I'm reporting a credible set. No, usually you're reporting just one credible set, namely the highest posterior density interval, because there are infinitely many credible sets, usually, and you didn't really tell me which one of those you're reporting because you have just one number or one set of numbers in your paper. Okay, so moving on, problems everywhere. I told you that we want to do Monte Carlo integration, but there's a problem. How to get draws from an intractable distribution? If I tell you the distribution is normal, you know, oh, go to MATLAB, use rent n, that will simulate numbers from a standard normal distribution. You can do that. But what if that distribution, my posterior distribution, is unknown? I don't know anything about it. How can I sample from it? And this is where so-called posterior sampling algorithms come in. Those are ways of constructing draws from an unknown distribution. They allow you to draw from that distribution, although you don't really know what type of distribution it is. There are three important ones, there's so-called important sampling, there's skip sampling, and there's the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. If you're doing time-varying Bayesian VARs, you will most of the times encounter Gibbs sampling. In the context of DSGE models, you're mostly working with Metropolis-Hastings algorithms, and here we will only focus on the last one. The Gibbs sampler is actually a special case of the last one. Important sampling is extremely efficient, but most of the times you cannot really apply it because you need to know quite a bit about the target distribution, the posterior. Most of the times we don't really know that. Okay, one more complication. Ideally, you would like to do Monte Carlo integration. You want to have IID draws. Why do you want to have IID draws? Because each single new draw is going to provide you with a lot of information or with a lot of new information in your parameter. If your draws are correlated, they're not going to provide you with as much information because your parameter now, uh, this iteration is related to the parameter at the previous iteration. So the amount of new information you're going to get in this iteration is a bit limited because your parameter will be quite similar to the one you had in the previous draw. From that logic, you can see that correlated draws are going to contain not as much information as IID draws. So think about a sequence for a Kaiva parameter that goes like 0 0.75, 0 0.78, 0 0.81, 0 0.75. That will give you a lot less information than something like 0 0.75, 0 0.9, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, something like this. Why? Because with correlated draws, you will be staying quite close over time to what you had in the previous draws. Because of this correlation, they called Monte Carlo Markov chains because of this correlation. They are Markov chains. The draw you had today is going to depend on the previous draw. There will be a source of inefficiency. Ideally, you would, have, would like to have independent draws, but most of the times you will not be able to get those. 
And that is important to keep in mind if you do diagnostics. We will return to this. Okay, everyone with me so far? Questions? Now looking at this. So we have two, two things here. So we, by now we know we want to characterize the posterior. Posterior, we want to sample from. So we need to have a posterior sampling algorithm. Fine. We will move to this in part four, Metrop uh, five, Metropolis Hastings. But before we can do this, we actually need to talk about, uh, where do we have it? The prior. That prior always shows up when you want to compute the posterior. So we need to talk about the prior. So there's a large discussion about the subjectivity of priors because my prior about the Calvo parameter might be different from yours. So I'm what you would probably call a saltwater economist. I work with new Keynesian models. I think pricing frictions are relevant. Thomas, you're in Chicago, right? Yeah. So your world might be very different. You're a freshwater right. economist, you might be more in line with Bob Lucas. No, the world is an RBC model. Prices are not sticky. So your prior about the Kyber parameter might be extremely different from mine. And I'm not sure we will ever agree on those. So that, that might be a problem if you have to referee my paper. You might say your prior is crap. And if I have to referee your paper, I might say your prior is crap. So from this, you, might, you see there is some issue here. So we will abstract in this talk or presentation from the philosophical issues arising. But of course, you need to be able to defend your prior. If you choose your prior too tight, if you say, okay, my Calvo parameter can never be different, be, cannot be below 0.6, and it cannot be above 0.9, then you might have a hard time defending that prior to a referee who says, yeah, you're not really allowing the interesting part of the state space. So choosing your prior is not uncontroversial. Some choices here are necessarily subjective, but why, why do I skip this? Because I think that the model you use is often more important than the prior about your parameters. So there is a lot of debate about the priors and you need to make those explicit because you need to specify. But pretty much nobody ever talks about why you use the particular model you have attached. Sometimes you have a referee telling you, hey, I should choose a different prior for that particular parameter, but they're not really saying, why didn't you consider a totally different model class? And the model might be a lot more important than the particular value of a parameter. So like saying, yeah, you might allow your kind of parameter to be a bit higher, might be less important than saying, yeah, why don't you use a heterogeneous agent model that allows for wealth inequality? So something like that. Be aware, if you get the wrong referee, then that might be coming very contentious because subjectivity in your prior might not square well with the scientific method, which by the way is the reason why most people don't really say, I choose my, uh, the prior based on my best knowledge, but often the way the literature proceeds is, I choose my prior as in Smets boundaries. So you say it's not really my prior, it's their prior. And because they published in the AER, you should accept that. So that's an argument by authority. So someone says, can we check the relevance of the model and sensitivity analysis? Yes, and you should do that. And I will talk a bit more about that in a minute. So what do we need to do? We need to specify this prior distribution P of theta. And again, in principle, this is a full multivariate distribution, which is hard. In practice, what then people do is they typically use independent priors. What do I mean with multivariate? So we saw the formula for the Calvo, uh, not for the Calvo, for the slope of the new Keynesian Phillips curve. This kappa depends on beta and theta. And beta and theta cannot really be independent. There's this evidence that the slope of the Phillips curve is around 0.03, if your theta, so price rigidity is really low, then that is going to imply a particular value for beta. 
in order for your slope of the Phillips curve to still be consistent with what you consider plausible for the slope of the Phillips curve. From that, uh, that example, you can see there needs to be in your prior, in principle, a relation between beta and theta. They're not independent, but rather they must interact in a way that we think the slope of the Phillips curve is plausible. That's why in principle, you need to specify a correlation at a minimum between the parameters. If theta is slope, then beta should be high and vice versa. But that is incredibly hard. Because of that, people typically use independent priors. They say, oh, I have my prior on beta, I have my prior on theta, and they have no relationship at all. You essentially say they aren't correlated. That's not really what we believe, but that's the way people typically work with those models. There is one notable exception, this paper I cite here, what they do, and it's similar to the Nikron Schorfheide, you choose priors that are consistent with particular observations in the data. For example, they say, yeah, you should pick your prior in a way that the slope of the Phillips curve is plausible. And that gives rise to what's called, what they think called block parameters, which is essentially a full multivariate distribution. So in the full semester course on Bayesian estimation, we would cover that stuff. Here, I just tell you, look, there are papers that do that more rigorously. Ideally, you should do it, but most of the literature just is chosen to ignore it. Our question is, what is the purpose of priors? Ideally, it's you want to incorporate information that's extraneous to your sample. It's not in the sample that you're looking at, but rather it's all the information you have, like lab evidence on the risk aversion and impatience of economic agents. As Bayesian pragmatists, it serves another purpose. You want to provide additional curvature to the likelihood function because that's going to straighten out the cliffs and it's going to remove local maxima in places where you don't want to have them. That's why sometimes people tweak the priors after seeing the data. So you see, my posterior doesn't really look nice, so I use more informative priors. Ideally, that's not the way the world is supposed to work. The prior is the information you have before seeing the data. So P of theta is not conditional on Y. If you observe your, your posterior, you think that doesn't make sense, and then you start tweaking your prior, then it's not a true prior anymore. As a true Bayesian, that's a no-go. You must not do it. That being said, people in literature often nevertheless do it. So that just as a warning. Now, how, I, how do I choose those priors? And the first thing to keep in mind is the feasible range of parameters is already going to narrow down your prior choice. So for example, the discount factor is between zero and one. You should not use a normal distribution because the normal distribution is going to tell you that it can be arbitrarily negative with some small probability, and it can also be infinity with a small probability. No, you need to have a distribution that's between zero and one. That shows you that the range of parameters is going to restrict your choices. Now, someone asked about the sensitivity analysis. Yes, you should check what happens if you change your model. And you should also check what happens if you change your prior. There is a paper in the AER by Lipa, Traum, and Walker. What they argue is you should always do a prior predictive. So check what your prior implies for the question you are asking. They do this in the context of estimating fiscal multipliers. And there had been a huge literature on models, on estimated DSGE models looking at fiscal multipliers, are they bigger than one or not? And what they here do is they say, okay, choose your standard prior, sample from the prior and see whether your model, given the prior even allows for, let's say a multiplier bigger than one, because there was always this issue, is, the multi is government spending self-financing? So big, multiplier bigger than one. And what they argue is no, most models don't even allow for getting a multiplier bigger than one, because the prior range is too small. And in that case, your data cannot even answer the question whether the multiplier is bigger than one, because based on your 
the range of prior parameters, you can never get a multiplier bigger than one. And then there is no point in estimating your model because you will not be able to let the model speak. Rather, it's all the model and the prior that's even going to restrict the feasible range of outcomes. So before estimating your model, always check what your model is capable of providing in terms of outcomes. Because what your posterior is going to do, it's going to narrow the range down. Anything you can consider impossible based on your prior and your model will not be feasible in the posterior as well. Okay, questions so far? Okay, so what we're doing here is full information estimation. So we use all the model moments. So the way estimation works is we maximize the likelihood. Likelihood means we minimize one step ahead forecast errors. And that usually means all the moments are used. That is on the one hand, a good thing because we're you're using all the moments in the data. Um, let's step back for a moment. If you had a normal distribution, you only would be caring about the first two moments. Generally, for an arbitrary distribution, you care about all the moments. The way estimation would work, for, or maximum likelihood would work for a normal distribution is you would use all second moments, not just the first autocorrelations, but you would also use, if you have 200 periods, the autocorrelation at order 200. How would you kind of intuitively select which of those moments to match to the data? The answer comes from a likelihood function. Moments that are very precisely estimated get a very high weight in the estimation. Moments that are not precisely estimated get a low weight in full information estimation. On the one hand, that is conceptually good. We use all the available information and use the weighting based on precision. If you think about writing a paper, that might be a bad thing because we're not matching moments. You might have a referee that tells you, oh, I want to see the standard deviation of output, investment, and inflation. Please show me. It might not be very precisely estimated, but if your point estimate is far away from what you have in the data, then you're in trouble because you cannot tell your referee, look, my autocorrelation at leg 200 is very precisely estimated. Your referee is going to tell you, I want to see those second moments. Your model performs like crap in that dimension. And it's very hard to say, oh, look, this was full information estimation. They often care a bit more about moment matching. And it regularly happens that estimated moments imply too high variances. One dirty trick has been done by Cristiano, Traban, and Valentin, and then a bit formalized by Lenecker and Schorfheide. It's what they call endogenous priors. It's essentially an oxymoron because priors should not be endogenous. And the idea is you motivate this by sequential learning. If you had an independent initial prior and you had a training sample, a pre-sample, you could use your pre-sample to update that prior. And your pre-sample is going to contain those moments. So you're putting a prior on the moments. And then you estimate your model. And because that updated prior, updated with actual data on the pre-sample, is going to be a lot more informative and a lot more helpful. The problem is, in practice, we often don't have a true pre-sample. We're happy if we have a lot of data that we can actually use. We, won't want, we can't really throw away data for a pre-sample. So what they did then is say, oh, yeah, we don't really have a pre-sample. What we do is we use the actual sample. So we augment the prior by the standard deviation of the actual observables and use that as a new prior. So it's kind of dirty in a sense, if you think about true Bayesian learning, because you're using your data twice. But it often solves this problem of having too high variances. And you can trigger it in Dynair by what's called the endogenous prior option. So that is implemented in Dynair. You can use it. And I used it in my own research, although 
you probably better not do it. Why? Hmm? Why? Why? Because you fictionally claim you're using a pre-sample. What you're doing is you're using an actual sample. I told you the prior is not supposed to be depending on yt. But what you're doing is you're actually using a prior that depends on yt. So you're not, not truly updating your prior. If you're a true Bayesian, then this is something you're not supposed to do. You update your prior once based on the data. You don't do that twice. Did that point come across? Yeah, but many people in machine learning, they tune hyperparameters like, like crazy. And so you don't really care about this idea. But yeah, just, so. It's just like progress is, is, is going. Yeah, but if you tune your hyperparameters, you usually don't really do that based on the data, right? Yes, <laughs> on a training sample, but that's a. Yeah, on a training sample, on a true training sample. But here you do that on the actual sample. So think, of, think about you were doing machine learning and you would not have a holdout sample, but you tweak your parameters based on fitting in sample. That would not be wise to do. There's another question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I don't fully understand what this endogenous priors has to do with the, with the, with the high variances of the... Of, of if you do variance. standard patient estimation, the moments of the data are not going to re oh, the, those second moments are not going to really affect your estimation in a way you would like that to do. What that endogenous prior does is you use the initial priors and then you update that prior based on the standard deviations of the observable. So that's just the second moments. And by doing that, you put a lot of weight on those standard deviations. And by doing that, the contemporaneous standard deviations, you're essentially matching those moments while at the same time doing full information maximum likelihood. And that helps you to counteract the high variances because those standard deviations, which are lower, get a weight in the prior, which, are good, which are, have a tendency to pull those two high variants down. That's what's going on here. Uh, okay, so it's like to have a prior instead of the parameters in the like in the moments of the data. No? Yeah, uh, you complement your independent prior by a prior on the standard deviations. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, Juan Carlos' question I will answer later. So I can kind of come back to that. Now, which prior to choose? So obviously, most natural one is a normal prior, looks like this. It has unbounded support and is symmetric. And you use that typically for feedback parameters where the sign is unknown. Take fiscal rule, you don't really know what the output feedback is for, for taxes. Might be pro-cyclical, might be counter-cyclical. Use a normal prior centered on zero. So you're agnostic on whether it's positive or negative because it's symmetric and it's centered around zero and can't take any way. That's basically it, something you can do. Now you can see here, this provides information because you're saying, okay, this one here with 0 0.8, so the one in the middle, zero, is two times more likely than this value of 0 0.6, which has a value of 0.4. Remember, posterior is likelihood times prior. You multiply it with the prior. If the prior has twice the value for this parameter, you're saying, I consider this twice as likely as this one. So that's the way it works. You're providing information on your prior for the likelihood to update. Now you could also do a uniform prior. Uniform prior has a lower and an upper bound. You can see here you're assigning the same weight to every value. There's no distinction for this value, this value, this value. All of them get 0.5. So for uniform prior, this is what your, P your PDF. I just have the formulas in here in case you might ever want to use them. So for example, in Dynia, you would specify a mean and the variance. And if you just lower the lower and the upper bound, you might use this formula to compute the variance you want to have. That's just. Now this prior here is flat. It doesn't have a curvature, so it's not going to, to provide information on 
what you're going to consider likely for the parameters. But keep in mind, so people often call this an uninformative prior, but it's not really uninformative because it's informative in the sense that you say all parameter values in that interval are equally likely. And that is usually information. Say you, you are estimating again the discount factor and you say, oh, it needs to be between zero and one. So let's use a uniform prior between zero and one. In that case, you're going to say, oh, it's as likely to be zero as it's likely to be 0 0.99. That's taking a stand and probably a crazy stand. One caveat, if you have bounds at infinity, your prior is improper. Why it has infinite bounds? And essentially a high, sorry, here a height of zero. It wouldn't integrate up to one. For Bayesian estimation, you don't care. If you do model comparison, where you're interested in the marginal data density, you care about this. The prior needs to integrate to one. In that case, you have a problem. So just Keep in mind, if you do model comparison, your prior needs to integrate to one. Okay, then we have a beta prior, which is something you might want to use if you do, if you estimate a discount factor. How do you do that? It's bounded between zero and one. And you use it often for auto regressive parameters, discount factors, chival parameters. And you can see here, it can take weird shapes. This beta distribution has a mean of 0 0.7. And the first one has a standard deviation of 0.1. So it's nice hump shape, looks a bit like a normal. And the second one has a standard deviation of 0 0.4. So keep in mind, usually we think about normal distributions. Oh, if I increase the variance, it becomes just more diffuse. So it's more uninformative. But with bounded distributions, that's not really what happens because there is only so much mass you can put to the sides. For the normal distribution, you just move everything out, so you stretch it. But here you can't stretch it further than zero and one. So if you crank up the standard deviation, the only points where the probability mass can go is zero and one. And that's what's happening here. You, you, you might argue, yeah, I make my prior more diffuse, diffuse by increasing the standard deviation. But what you're actually saying is, oh, I'm putting an incredible weight on my parameter to be equal to one and to be equal to zero. And I put hardly any weight on the mean. That is something to keep in mind. You should always plot your prior distribution. There is one paper in the AER with around 900 citations that slightly modified the smets waters prior on the Calvo parameter where if you plot it, it looks like this. They're essentially saying, I think my Calvo parameter is either zero or one with a high probability. And that's clearly not how the world works. So always plot your prior. Particularly beta distributions can have very weird shapes. Yeah. Which paper is it? Uh, I'd rather not tell. Okay. <laughs> because I, I can tell you later on MetaMost, but if the video goes online, it's probably better not to spill the beans here too much. But I will potentially be threshing a couple of other papers later on. Okay, as I said, it's between zero and one, but you can scale it. It's called a generalized distribution. Dynair allows for it. And it's relatively flexible in terms of shape. You need to be a bit careful. I already told you this. So always plot your prior. Then you have cases where parameters are between zero and infinity. And in that case, you can use a gamma distribution. You can see it's either single peaked or monotonically, uh, or hump shaped or monotonically decreasing. You can pick a cho uh, choice here and zero is included. And you typically use that for shock variances. They need to be positive or for Taylor root feedback parameters because they need to be bigger than, let's say, one in order to satisfy the Taylor principle. This is the formula for it. We don't really care. Just if you ever program it yourself, 
the parameterization for those distributions differs in MATLAB and Dynair and also in other ways. So sometimes the mapping can become a bit cumbersome. So just if you ever encounter this, you need to be careful what you're working with. Then there is the inverse gamma distribution. It's also between zero and infinity, but here zero is not included. And usually it's more hump shaped, as you can see here. And again, you typically use that for variances. The thing with an inverse gamma is if something is gamma distributed, then one over this thing will be inverse gamma. This is the PDF. And purely theoretically, it's a better choice for variances if you want to prevent stochastic singularity. Did you talk about stochastic singularity in the summer school already? It should have shown up in particle filtering. Yes, no? Yes, Professor Karame talked about it. Exactly. So it means at a minimum, you need to have as many shocks as observables. Otherwise, your model is going to imply a perfect linear combination within observables that's typically not satisfied. That is stochastic singularity in a nutshell. But that means if you have as many shocks as observables, you need all shocks. If one of them has a variance of zero, it's going to drop out of the model. So if you use a gamma prior that conceptually allows for a shock to have a zero variance, it drops out of the model, that would not be allowed because of stochastic singularity. So theoretically, then inverse gamma is a better choice because it excludes zero. But for a gamma distribution, what's the probability of observing a zero variance? Zero. Why? Um. Because I guess like gamma is strictly positive and uh... it's a con it's a continuous probability distribution. Also, a continuous yeah. probability distribution. The probability of of observing an exact value is always zero. It's a zero probability event. So in a sense, this is kind of a moot point. Whether zero not is included, you will never observe. It. So kind of kind of forget about this. Yeah. So this is an example. Like Dynair will plot your priors. And you should always check whether they look sensible. So here for the autocorrelation coefficients, I say, oh, they're roughly 0 0.0. So my shocks will be autocorrelated, but not crazily so. So always plot them. Now, here we have actually one of the mode check plots I alluded to. They're going to show you in blue the log posterior. In red, the log likelihood kernel. And the difference between the likelihood and the posterior is the prior. So whenever the shape of the functions differs, that's where your prior really matters. You can see here for those three parameters, it doesn't really matter. For rho g, it does. So your prior tells you, so the data says, yeah, I think higher values are more likely. And your prior says, oh, in the posterior, I think it's a bit lower. So that's what, how you interpret this. OK, so what yeah. should we do if, if uh, there's too much difference or the shape is radically different? It means that we, we use a, a prior that has too much influence or we should not necessarily. It? it just means that it might mean your data is not too informative. So if your data doesn't contain any information about the parameter, then your posterior will be equal to the prior. It's just a bit informative of what is the role of my prior. Asymptotically, the prior will always vanish, usually. Because if you have infinite data, then you put all your weight on the data, none on the prior. Yeah. Now someone asks, what do the numbers on the y-axis mean in the, in the prior's image? It's a dent. You mean this one, for example? Sebastian? Yes. It's a density. If you take a normal distribution, you have, a, I, get, I tell you, oh, normal distribution with, and I want to know, so what's the density of the normal distribution, standard normal distribution at zero? You plug that into your formula for the normal distribution, you get the density of standard normal distribution at the value zero is 0.8. That's the density. 
for other distributions, the density values are different, but it's the density of your prior. It's a prior distribution. So for each value of the prior on the x-axis, there is a corresponding density value. Does that answer the question? Hi, Professor. Yeah, it, it answered it. It's just I, I was struggling because I was thinking like it would be bounded between zero and one. And then we have these values that goes to 200 and 300. And that, yeah, that's keep yeah. in mind, we're not talking about probabilities. Probabilities mm -hmm. were for, would be for discrete events. We're talking about densities. We know that the sum, so the integral over the density function yep. needs to sum up to one. But that means, for example, take a beta distribution or even take a distribution that puts uh, that would be bounded like this one and cut off and cut off a part here, for example. Then that mass needs to be somewhere else because otherwise it wouldn't add up. And for densities, this is what happens. Densities are, are not really bounded. They can be quite unintuitive numbers. Okay. So there's okay. always a question, can the log likelihood of my model be positive? Because mm -hmm. usually you think about, yeah, likelihood is between zero and one, log of zero would be infinity, log of one would be zero, so the log likelihood needs to be negative. No, we're talking about the density. So the log of a density that's bigger than one will be positive, so anything goes. Okay, okay. perfect. Thank Welcome. You. Okay, so that was the inverse gamma. Now there is a question. I don't understand how often how people fix the tightness of the prior. Is there a way to make the tightness of the prior endogenous in these GE models? Not really. The point of the prior is this is how you set your uncertainty about the prior. So if you look at, at a picture like this. It's your job as the researcher to specify how certain you are. And I'm pretty, for example, for the TFP shock here, I'm pretty confident that the TFP shock doesn't have, a st doesn't have an autocorrelation that's lower than 0 0.3. That would be crazy. We know those shocks are autocorrelated. And I also incorporate here that, no, it will not be bigger than one. That's my way of saying, okay, I consider this range likely. And the way you consider that or you choose the tightness is usually by looking at those pictures and say, yeah, it's probably capturing how I think that the world works. So take here standard deviation of my government spending shock. Usually they are somewhere in around in a range of 1% per quarter. And then consider it pretty unlikely that there is each quarter a 2% government spending shock happening. And that's the way you approach this. Of course, if you had a training sample, you could do it differently. You could just use the training sample. But usually, it's your job to look at the picture and say, OK, this is how I specify. And when in doubt, be, choose a wider prior. And if you think, if you say, I have no clue about what the parameter could ever be, use a uniform prior. It will not impose any information because you don't have information. That's the way priors work. Other questions? There's a oh, raised hand. Please, let me ask you a question. Um, my question is just a verification on uh, slide seven. Slide seven. 37. 37 or 27. Yes. 37, mm. 37. That's 37, yeah. You mean this one? No. Three, three. But we are, Pro. are we there yet? Oh yeah, this one. Yes. So you say that we should notice how the prior affect the posterior of uh, rho G. So just to be clear, we want the blue and the red line to overlay. Is that correct? No, not necessarily. We can't really okay. say that. Okay. The, so. That is not a valid statement because that would imply that the posterior is equal to the likelihood. If you use a uniform prior, that will always be the case. 
So that's not it. It would tell you that your like your posterior doesn't provide. Uh, sorry, your prior doesn't really provide information. With if you had infinite data, that would actually be the case. Those two lines need to be the same. Otherwise, you're in trouble. But with infinite data, there's no way to make sure of that because it might just be that your data is not informative. If there is weak identification, there's typically not much you can do about it. So Willy will tell you what that means, weak identification. And typically if there is weak or if there is relatively weak identification, those two lines will be different. And there's not much you can do about it. It's just the way it is. Okay, that, that takes me to uh, the data you provided to Rose. I, I'm aware that it is very difficult to get uh, data on average uh, effective taxes, uh, especially for capital and labor, but you've provided some. So in a situation where you've used data to construct, say maybe another data, and you're not sure the extent of the, um, what they call it, the, the, the extent of uh, the errors in such constructed data, how can you justify that use when you are feeding it into your DSG model? And if you're not sure about the data quality, you would add measurement error usually. Okay. That's typically the way it works. Now, let's look, quickly have a look at this. What I mean with weak identification. What you're trying to do is likelihood times prior, we want to maximize that. We want to find the highest point. And you can see here in the direction of row Z, we're quite flat. So in terms of likelihood, there's not much of a difference whether I have zero or one here, which is the reason why often the data will not be that informative because from the perspective of the likelihood, there's not that much of a difference between choosing zero or one. You can see that there's not much curvature. And that's where the prior most likely has a lot of influence. In contrast, if you're at the back here for some reason, so let's say um, I know I'm here, then suddenly, at least in the direction of sigma z, there's a lot of information contained in the likelihood function. In that case, the prior is most likely not being informative or important because the likelihood already contains a lot of information on what the parameter is most likely to be. But as I said, you will be discussing that a lot more with Willy tomorrow. Okay, what else do we have? So sometimes people perform, they estimate some parameters and for others they stick to calibration. If you're a true Bayesian, you could just call that dogmatic priors. Because you say, my prior is that parameter has one particular value and that's my value. Of course, you would need to defend that. Often the way you do that, or why do you do that is often because those parameters are not really well identified and we have an idea what they might be. So typical examples are risk aversion. Risk aversion is often not well identified and we often think it's block utility or something like that. People often just do that. They say, okay, some parameters we fix, which is essentially a point prior and the others we estimate. Usually we estimate those parameters where we don't have a really good idea. So if you, start, if you write down a small open economy model of an emerging economy, then usually it's standard to say, okay, sigma risk aversion is five. And your referee will probably not bet an eye if you say that. But if you have a new mechanism in there, let's say you work something with financial frictions, and then you put in a dogmatic value for that financial friction, your referee will most probably say, yeah, but we don't have prior evidence on that parameter. That is a parameter that should be estimated. And that, tells you how to split the parameters. The ones where we don't have a good idea, where we want data to tell us what's the value, those you should definitely estimate. Those where we have a good clue, often it's efficient to just fix them. Does that answer the question? Juan? Yeah, okay. 
how to choose the most eloquent distribution for our parameters and how, yeah. So for the prior, it's a prior, it's your a priori knowledge. You have to decide, I find a picture like this plausible or not. It's really, it's up to you and to defend it. If you have absolutely no clue, look into the literature what other people have done. You might find that plausible as well. There are probably a dozen posts in the Dynair forum that have one variety or another of that question. It's really, it's up, it's your job to specify this. How to interpret prior and posterior distributions, we will come to that later on. Okay, shall we do a five minute break or just continue? It's up to you. Do a break. Okay, then let's do a five minute break. Let's meet at five past five again. Mm -hmm. continue the recording. So what we do here is we tweak the acceptance probability of a new draw, and we start with some proposal density. And the resulting chain that you get are draws from the posterior. You can actually show that this satisfies a reversible Markov chain. So this will uh, at some point sample from the ergodic distribution. This is actually what you're interested in. Of course, theory tells us this is all, those are only valid draws once we pass the transient stage. So you start at some vector, and then you need to throw in, throw away a burn in to make sure that the draws that you actually get are draws from the posterior. And then once you have discarded that drawing, there's this theorem that tells you, look, those are valid draws from the posterior that you can use for Monte Carlo integration. That's what we're going to do. This burn-in is required to make sure that the remaining chain is converged. And this convergence is something you should usually check more on that later. As I said, if you have a symmetric proposal density as you have that usually in Dynair, then the scaling probability simplifies to the ratio of the posteriors. What does that mean? It means whenever that new draw theta tilde is more likely than the old draw, that ratio will be bigger than one. So the acceptance probability is equal to one. You will always accept that. So what the algorithm tells us, whenever there is a proposed jump uphill, that means to a region of higher posterior density, you accept that draw. In contrast, if the new draw has a lower posterior than the old draw, then that ratio will be smaller than one. There is only some probability of accepting that move. So you jump downhill with some probability. It looks like this. So if you start here at theta zero and you get this proposed, it's a point of higher likelihood, you always jump up here. But if you start here and now it's proposed that theta tilde here, there is some acceptance probability that you should make that jump downhill. You should never always do that jump downhill. Why? Because you're moving in a range where this parameter value is rather unlikely. And then Metropolis Hastings gives you exactly the right balance of jumping around the parameter space to efficiently evaluate this shape of the posterior. You get more draws of the high points and you get fewer draws of the low points. That's the whole idea behind this thing. Everyone with me so far? Yes. Okay, good. Now, the one thing I didn't really tell you about, what is this Q? What's the proposal density? How, do, how should that look? like? And how does convergence work? The answer is there is a theorem that tells us if there are some irregularity conditions are satisfied, any proposal density Q will ultimately lead to convergence to the invariant distribution. So pretty much you can use anything that satisfies the regularity conditions. But, and this is the big but, the speed of convergence to the, to the ergodic distribution may significantly differ. And because we only have finite lifetimes, we might actually care. Sometimes we don't care that much because it might still work out, but you should spend some time in making sure that you have the right proposal. What people in practice do is they often use the random walk Metropolis Hastings where you say, 
essentially this here, the new draw is the old draw plus some increment. So some proposed jump. You start at the actual accept the parameter value and then you propose to jump from there either left or right with the same probability. That would be the random walk because you're centered around the previous draw. Now what then off, what you still need to specify is what's the proposal for that increment Z. And what people typically say, yeah, for that increment, we center it around zero and we use either a normal or a T distribution. So we have some proposal and okay, mean is zero. So what you need to specify here is the covariance of that jumping distribution. Typically we have two elements. We have that C, which is a scaling parameter. That's a scalar. And we have the actual covariance matrix. So you need the scaling matrix and the scaling factor. How should you efficiently do this? And the idea is you construct a Gaussian approximation to the posterior and use the asymptotic covariance matrix as a scaling matrix. Essentially what you have is in the background, a theory that tells you that asymptotically your posterior should be close to normal. So it should be looking like a normal. And what you then do is you treat it like a normal distribution and use, let's say, if it looks like this, use the shape of that distribution up here as the covariance distribution, as your, as your proposal distribution or the covariance of that distribution. You essentially say, okay, I approximate this normally and I use the covariance of the, or the, if it is very universal, the standard deviation of the normal distribution at the evaluated this, this peak as my proposal. And here you see the catch. And Thoma, Thomas just said something about the Hessian at the mode. This is where this comes from, because we're saying, oh yeah, we want to approximate that proposal distribution using a normal distribution at the mode. And we want to have the covariance matrix. And the covariance matrix needs to be positive definite. There are no negative variances. That's a problem. So conceptually here, we want to have this asymptotic covariance matrix. We want to use that sigma because it allows efficient evaluation around the mode. Quick side note, asymptotically, we know the prior plays no role. So the posterior will only depend on the likelihood. Coop in his textbook, approximates the likelihood function. Unsurefied approximates the posterior. We do what the latter do. People in the literature usually use this Gaussian approximation to the posterior. So they look at the posterior mode, not at the mode of the likelihood. Just if you look at the textbook, they do it a bit differently than most articles do. So why do we do this? Because this normal approximation is justified by asymptotic normality if there are some regularity conditions. Okay. Problem is convergence may be slow. Why? Because some parameters cannot really be normally distributed. Think about the discount factor beta. It's between zero and one. Normal distribution has infinite support. So having the normal distribution become so single peaked around the true value that it's a good approximation will take like forever. Because of that, sometimes it's better to reparameterize your model. Like in your model, instead of beta, you estimate a parameter that is a logarithmic or the logistic transformation of that parameter. Because that logistic transformation of beta will have infinite or unbounded support. And then that approximation works better. So as I said here, you can do a log transformation of positive parameters or log it for unit interval. That is one of the tricks in the literature. But that's more advanced. Now, technical considerations. That's where most of you might actually sometimes run into trouble. The usual way you do that when you want to use the asymptotic covariance matrix is you use a numerical optimizer to find the posterior mode. And then theory tells you that the Hessian at that mode should be equal to that covariance matrix. But that equality only holds if you're truly at the mode. Otherwise, that Hessian will not be equal. And even worse, if you're not at a mode, this Hessian will not be positive definite. And remember, a covariance matrix needs to be positive definite, while the mode might not be. 
So the first thing is, how do I find the mode? One of the things is non-derivative-based optimizers might often perform better. Why? Because if your posterior really looks like an egg crate and there are multiple local maxima, then using something derivative-based will bring you to the nearest maximum, but that might be a local. So optimizers like mode compute 9 or 8 in Dynair are rather global, non-derivative-based. They often perform better, at least for a first pass. But keep in mind, finding the mode is hard and time intensive. So you should try often a sequence of different optimizers because time spent in finding the mode will often save you a lot of time in running a the Markov chain later on. You can save millions of draws by spending a couple of hours on just finding the mode. Again, yeah. you could say, yeah. So the, the, the mode compute, uh, um, What's the different algorithm that you use that are global? So the, the simplex one? Nine would be the covariance matrix adaptive evolutionary strategy. Mm -hmm. There is also simulated annealing. Okay. There is something that MATLAB provides. Uh -huh. okay. I would have to look up the name. No, 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 manual, I'll check that. Okay. Yeah. So of course you could say in some sense, finding the mode is not important because we know that if the regularity conditions are met and that usually means the positive definite scaling matrix, then you will converge to the ergodic distribution. And what does that mean? That means whenever you, you can use any positive definite covariance matrix in infinite time, you will be sampling from the distribution that interests you. So if you really fail in finding the mode, often the way is just to say, okay, in Dynair, I specify the identity matrix, let me run the Markov chain and see where it leads me. And then maybe later on restart with the new values. Mode compute six is a bit like this. It's just essentially running a Markov chain and then see where that brings you. This is heavily inefficient in a sense, but theory tells you in infinite time, you will be ending up where you would like to be. And sometimes just starting somewhere already brings you closer to where you want to be. So that often works. So as I said, this is, unfortunately, this is quite inefficient as mode compute six does. And actually the simulated annealing kind of has this idea. Jump downwards with some probability, jump always upwards and see where that leads you. If you have only finite time, you still might want to try to get as close as possible. Actually, you should always see, well, even if you start at a local mode, you should check how things work out over time. So often, if you start at a local mode, you will see a slow drift in the parameters and the posterior density. And that's where the trace plots come in. They allow you to check whether your chain drifts. And I will show you a picture of that later on. So now this was, this was just mode fine. If you have the mode, you can actually use as a scaling matrix sigma this inverse Hessian at the posterior mode. That's what Thomas alluded to. And one of the most asked questions uh, in the Dynair forum is, yeah, it's not positive definite. What can, I, what can I do? Theory only tells you if this is an interior maximum, then that Hessian matrix will be positive definite. From that, you can see there are a couple of issues. First, if you're not at a maximum, then this thing is not guaranteed to be positive definite. The second thing is I said, at an interior maximum. So what we're doing is we're approximating something at its peak. It's because this is nice and well behaved and has the curvature we like to have. Now, if you run into a parameter bound, I actually delete that. Let's say it looks like this. And then here comes the bound. This is your maximum. If you try to approximate this, this doesn't have the shape you would like it to have because it's not an interior maximum. So as soon as you run into prior bounds, implicit or explicitly, you're in, tr you're in trouble. Those are the cases where you could, ex for example, say, okay, I'm at that boundary. That's just the way it is. I use the identity matrix as my proposal density because that approach of using the Hessian will clearly not work. 
Um, that being said, most of the times, actually, if you find that your Hessian is not positive definite, there is still a more fundamental problem in your model. So it's never a good idea to just say, yeah, I specify a covariance matrix because I can't get the model to run otherwise. Often it's a sign of deeper issues, like you specify the wrong observation equations, you have still trending data and you run into parameter regions where the model is not supposed to be. That's one of those things. Or a parameter is not identified. If a parameter is not identified, then the likelihood will be, the, or the posterior will be the same for every single parameter. Value. If this is flat, then obviously it doesn't have the curvature you need for a positive definite hash. Those are all the things where you should actually have a look at those plots. Ideally, the mode, which is this vertical line, is supposed to be at the highest point. If it's not, have a look why that is the case. And often those plots are informative. It could be that you are at the bound, so the picture just cuts off. It could be that there are red dots. Red dots usually signify Blochard-Kahn condition violations or missing steady states or things like that. Or it might, might just be that you have very crazy pictures. And in those cases, you should dig deeper into why that is the case. So with crazy, I mean wiggling, or it's, it looks like this. It goes still up. In that case, you know that your mode compute failed. And in that case, either you start working with a different mode compute, or you try to find out why you're stuck at that point. And often there's really still some problem with the model. Okay. As I said, conceptually you use the inverse Hessian at the mode. Often, so the, the true, the theoretical inverse Hessian at a true mode is positive definite, but the numerical one, the conjecture mode often is not. And what people in the literature often do is they employ various dirty tricks. So one of the things is a matrix being positive definite means all eigenvalues are strictly positive. Not being positive definite might means that at least one of the eigenvalues is zero or smaller than zero. So what can you do? You do a Jordan eigenvalue decomposition. You take the eigenvalue, eigenvalues, you set the negative or zero eigenvalues to a small positive value, you recompose the matrix, and you have a positive definite hash. There are a couple of papers that actually do that, one of them in the AR. They never state that they actually did that. So, but as I said, any positive definite matrix is usually going to work. So this is an inefficiency, but it's often successful. Keep in mind that for replication purposes, you still need to inform people what you actually did there. Here for this one, you can't really make sure that this approximation to the true Hessian is, is performing well. There is something called a generalized Koleski decomposition that does uh, a good, a rather good approximation to the next or the, to the closest positive definite matrix to the one you're working with. So, Dania also has this, but yeah. And you could try different step sizes for the numerical differences that you use. So, any questions on the scaling make uh, on the covariance matrix so far. Excuse me, you said uh, any positive definite matrix can be used. We can use the identity matrix or it is ruled out? No, you can, it's positive definite, it's positive variance. It might be inefficient, which will show up in you needing a very, very long chain, but conceptually it will work. Okay, thank you very much. Of course, what won't work is using the identity matrix because you didn't get a positive definite Hessian if there is a fundamental problem in your model. So you, you setting a fixed matrix does not cure more fundamental issues. But if everything else is fine and the only issue is getting a positive definite matrix, 
you can use anything. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, so that, that answers my question. I think like I have a deep um, fundamental problem in my model. I did not want to hear that. But um, also, um, I have a situation where like when I estimate some parameter, everything was fine, everything is concave. Yeah. And then I add some more parameters to uh, like do this joint estimation and then it fails. And so usually what I did, I kind of worked. It's probably not a good solution, but I was fixing the first one I estimated. Like usually it was a variance of the shocks. And then I estimate like the other yeah. parameters and then it works as well. Then it's concave and, and like everything is working well. But then when I do jointly, it's not working somehow. Okay, but that might be because so this, this sounds a lot like an identification issue, that each of those parameters is, is separately identified, but jointly they are not. And jointly being not a uh, linear combination not being identified means your hash net mode will be singular because there is one direction that is collinear, and that might show up in a problem like this. And, and that's what I meant with often those failures signify something more fundamental. And always run identification. Yeah, I did. But, but thank you. I'll, I'll check more on that. OK. Anything else? Don Rinan is asking, if you have different variables, does the order in the var op statement matter? No, the order doesn't matter at all. It doesn't influence anything. OK. so. I told you there is this proposal density. We use that to be a normal. We talked about that sigma. Now we still need that c squared, the scaling factor. How do I choose that? Why is that even important? The answer is it will affect the acceptance rate. Because a bigger c means our proposal is going to propose bigger moves. If this is really large, you will propose very the jumps very far away because that innovation to the current parameter is really large. And that is going to affect the acceptance rate because think about you start at the highest point, you can only jump downwards. And now you're proposed jumping, jumping really, really far away from the mode. That draw is very unlikely to be accepted. At the same time, if you have a small jump, your parameter, the new proposed draw, is very likely to be accepted because you're still close to the mode, but you're not really covering a lot of space in the sample space because you're not proposing very new draws. Everything is still close to the mode. Now consider a case where the sample has converged and we are sampling the area around the mode. If you're scaling the C squared is too wide, you're going to propose really a lot of very implausible draws far away from the mode. And we know that the metropolis hastings is going to reject a lot of them because the acceptance probability is really, really low. What does that mean? More on that in a minute. Now I'll take the opposite. If the scaling is too small, many likely parameter vectors close to the mode will be proposed and they will be accepted. So the acceptance probability is high. So which of the two cases do we prefer? Do we prefer any of those? The right split in between. Yeah, why? <laughs> the answer is, the problem is here, you will be under sampling low probability regions with the new draws. Your sampler will take a very long time to traverse the support of the density. So you will be staying very close to the region that you're in. And only occasionally you will have a big jump and accept the parameter quite far away. That is not good. If the scaling is too wide, you have a similar issue because you're again staying at the mode because jumps far away are extremely unlikely and you will all reject them and you stay stuck at where you are. So in the first case, you're always getting the same parameter over and over again because everything is rejected and the acceptance probability is low. In the second case, the acceptance probability is really, really high, but you're staying extremely close to the mode. In both cases, you don't gain any new information. Because in the first case, there is no new parameter draw. And in the second case, all new parameter draws essentially contain the same information you had before. 
So in both cases, you get high autocorrelation in the draws. There is a paper by Roberts, Gelman, and Wilkes that says if the target and the proposal are normal densities, then for one parameter, you should have an acceptance rate of 45% and 23% for infinitely many parameters and already 25 for six parameters. That's the reason why people usually aim at a value of around 25 to 30%. That's the sweet spot you want to be in. So this here is an example. The left picture is one of the trace plots I talked about in the beginning. It's just, uh, this is 30, 10, of, 10 to the power of four, that should be 3000 draws of posterior. Here, the gray area are my draws. So this is for FC. That's a standard deviation of my TFP shock. So it's most likely somewhere between one and 3%. So it jumps up or down. And you can see here, it's sometimes quite up. It's sometimes quite down. And then here, the black line is the 200 period moving average. And you see there are still those slow, persistent movements. So there is some autocorrelation. If I'm up, it's likely followed by high values. If it's low, it's likely followed by low values. That's not something we want to have. Ideally, remember, we want to have IID draws. This picture doesn't look like IID. And you can verify this by this autocorrelation plot. You can see that the half-life in terms of autocorrelation is around 20 draws. So if you do a loose interpretation, then, so here we have a correlation after one period of around 95%. So each new draw only contains something like 5% new information. Because ideally, you would like zero correlation, where each new draw contains completely new information. That's not the case here, because subsequent draws tend to stay where you currently are. So we have bad mixing left, and the autocorrelation function decays slowly. Here, my acceptance rate was 2.5%. You always stay where you are. This here is an example where, example where my acceptance rate is too high. It's 85%. Again, extremely high autocorrelation and those very persistent movements. That's not what you want to have. Again, bad mixing and autocorrelation decays slowly. This here is an example where my acceptance rate is 21%, right on the sweet spot, 23% it should be. And you can see the gray line, again, now looks quite more like IID. There is some low frequency movement, but it still it wiggles a lot more. And you can see the autocorrelation function decays a lot more slowly, uh, quite, uh, a lot faster. So this is the way it's supposed to be. In your problem set or your homework, you're supposed to plot this and have a look. Something I should also say is when you do this general trace plots, it's also going to show you a trace plot of the posterior density. And sometimes what you see is you start at a value like this, and then it slowly moves up like this. This would be parameter drift. That shows you you didn't start at the mode, but rather a different value, and your chain slowly settled away from it. That usually is an indication of non-convergence. Remember, you want to draw from the ergodic distribution. So your chain should look nice. If it still has a trend, there is a problem. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, if it has a trend at the beginning, but then slowly it kind of converge and, and yeah. do this more oscillation, that's fine. Um, yeah, as long as you have a sufficient burn-in. I see. So let me see whether I can find that. That's somewhere here. No, nope, that's not it. I am looking for is that including. No, where is the appendix? No, don't have that here. I could, I'm looking for. Okay. 
trace plot where I might be able to show you this, but currently I don't really see that. So sometimes you have bimodal distributions. Don't provide a good example by now, where you have parameters sometimes wiggling something like this, like here, and then it jumps up, it wiggles here, then it jumps down again, and it jumps up again. That might happen as well. And that is really challenging. In that case, your distribution has more than one mode, and then certain convergence is harder. In that case, you might want to go for a different sampler. Like Dynair has the slice sampler developed by Marco Ratto. I'm not sure whether he's going to tell you something about it, but that seems to be a lot more efficient in dealing with that type of responses. Okay. So how can I ensure convergence? Our time is almost up. So as I said, ideally you want to have IID draws from a posterior. We only get correlated draws. So high autocorrelations might signify problems, even, but even with the optimal acceptance rate, there might be high autocorrelation. So in that case, it might be good to check different proposal densities. Sometimes that helps. And in Dynair, we also have this tailored random plot metropolis Hastings that is a lot more efficient in dealing with cases where you have high autocorrelation. So different samplers sometimes help. Now, how do I monitor convergence? So ideally you want to have draws from this stationary distribution. How do I monitor that? And there are three ways of doing that. The vehicle convergence diagnostics, the brook gammon one, and the Raftery lewis So I'm not going to delve into them in detail. You have everything here on the slides. I'm trying to give you just gist of it. Uh, my favorite ones are the first one and the third one because they don't rely on eyeball interactions. With Giveki, the idea is if you have sufficient draws from a long chain, then the draws from the first part of the chain should be similar in properties to the last part. Why? They come from the same distribution. How can you check that? You could say, okay, take draws at the beginning, take draws at the end, and see, for example, whether the mean is the same thing. So essentially you do a t-test where you test whether the means are the same thing, whether they come from the same distribution. That's a statistical test of saying, okay, given the mean at the standard deviation in the first part of the chain and the last part of the Monte Carlo Markov chain, are they similar? And you can test it basically based on standard two sample t-test. Uh, sorry, one sample t-test. There's only one slight problem. If you want to estimate that numerical standard error here of the chain, you need to be aware that there are, those are correlated draws. So you need to think new US standard type errors. So you need to take care that you have the right one, the right standard error. So new US is the way to go. And in Dynair, it looks like this. If you have this posterior mean, you have the standard deviation for the parameter. And then you have a test for equality of means here for the 20,000 draws after a burn-in as opposed to 50,000 draws at the end of the chain. And if you do that taper, that means that is the strongest cor correction in new West for the autocorrelation. We cannot reject the null hypothesis that they come from the same distribution. So this suggests, suggests they come from the same distribution. Remember, this is a multivariate distribution. If one of those parameters has not converged, then that's an indication that your whole chain hasn't converged. So it doesn't really help you if you reject all except for let's say two, but those two have strongly not converged, then you're still in trouble. The brooks gelman convergence diagnostics is a lot more complicated to explain. I'm just showing you, or essentially the idea is you run two chains. So you start chains at different points in the state space, and those two chains should, in the end, converge to the same thing. They should be similar to each other. Because regardless of where you start, you should end up in the same ergodic distribution. So if you start them far away, once they have converged, they should give you the same thing. How can you do that? You could, for example, do that by comparing the variances in the chains. And essentially, this is the picture that Dynair does. 
like this. It looks at sequence variances in two different chains. So blue is one chain, red is the other chain. And what should happen is they should become close to each other and be flat, do not change anymore. And my problem with that diagnostics is it's just eyeballing. So is this close enough and is it flat? I don't really know. Some people would argue yes, other people would argue no. That's why I don't really spend a lot of time explaining this because I prefer things like the Givicki one. The third one I can recommend, and that is rather new, I think it's in 4.6 only implemented, is the Raftery Lewis. And the idea is how many draws do you need to make sufficiently precise statements about the quantile of a posterior function. So they essentially say, if I have a Markov chain, how many draws do I need to estimate a given quantile within a certain precision with a, with a given probability? So let's say I'm interested in estimating the 90% highest posterior density interval. Then the question is, how many draws do I need in order to estimate that with, say, a, pro a precision of plus minus 1%. So I'm, instead of having 90% highest posterior density intervals, uh, something like from 9 to 89 or from 11 to 91% in coverage with a certain probability. So that's really the idea. How many draws do I need to achieve a given precision? Given what we observe in variance in the draws. So typically it's something like we want to report a 95% highest posterior density intervals to have an actual posterior probability between 92.5% and 97.5% with 95% probability, 95 probability. So the error of making a mistake is just 5% and we accept that in terms of a tolerance. And in order to achieve that, that diagnostics is going to tell you you need to drop M draws as a burn-in. And then once you have that, you need n draws of which we take every kth one. So the central idea is you construct a Markov chain out of your observed draws in order to estimate those things. So all the formulas are on the slides. I'm going to show you the output. What Dynair is going to tell you for the parameter rho g, for example, you need to have a burn in of 26 observations. And that's the neat thing here. It tells you immediately how many draws you should drop. And then it says, OK, after that, we need here around 30,000 draws. For that one, around 40,000. So in total, you should have around 40,000 draws. And that's kind of a nice thing with that diagnostics, because it tells you, on the one hand, what is your recommended burn in? And on the other hand, how many draws should I use? And again, I find that a lot neater than staring at those graphs and then doing eyeballing econometrics. Um, remember, those tests are only necessary, not sufficient. Essentially, you're, testing, you're doing hypothesis testing. So just because you can't reject violations doesn't mean your chain has actually converged. So proving that it has converged it's pretty much impossible. You can only hope for a, for convergence not being rejected. That's Sorry. the thing that you have. Here. Um, how would non-convergence be shown on on this output? Would would be uh, like a burning that is not shown or no? It would essentially tell you that regardless of how many draws you have, mm -hmm. you still need more. And and this is after you've done the estimation. Yeah. You can only so, do so this after I, the estimation. If if I have a million draws and afterwards it says like n required is a million that probably means like it didn't work yeah or, exactly okay. and in that case it's always good to look at the trace plots they will often yeah. show you what the problem is okay thank you and there you will typically see what what the issues and once you have done that it should look like this or you will get a picture like this you have the prior distribution which is great you have the black distribution which is uh, the posterior and typically, they should be the posterior should be more more narrow and more focused, because that tells you that your prior was updated. And you can see here for most parameters, the data seems to be informative. 
because you can see here that the black lines are more concentrated. The exception is row Z. And here, remember, in the beginning, I showed you this picture and I told you, oh, for row Z, the likelihood is flat. You can immediately see this. Here, the likelihood and the prior don't seem too different. That's an indication that the data is not that informative. Purely in terms of analytics, actually there are two things that can happen. It could be that you just accidentally picked the right, in a sense, the right prior. Because if you pick the actual posterior with the prior, then obviously there's no point in updating it. But more likely the data is actually informative. And before you move over to potentially move over to the Q&A session of Frederick, I will leave you with one counterexample. I told you I'm going to thrash one paper at least, and I decided on this one. You might probably know at least two of those authors. And they do estimation. Presumably in Dynair, because you will probably see those, uh, those pictures will probably look familiar to you. And whenever your posterior doesn't look as nice and well behaved as this, smooth, but rather it's completely wiggly like this, something is off. Particularly if you get a picture like this. You can pretty much imagine that if you smooth this out, that it actually looks like this. If you have more draws, your prior is most probably going to look exactly like the posterior. What does that tell you? That parameter is most likely not identified. And it gets even worse. If you zoom in here for lambda L, who spots the prior? The prior is immediately below the posterior, which again is an indication that estimation was not successful because here the prior and the posterior are virtually identical, which typically is a sign of non-convergence. So here definitely estimation went wrong. So something is really freaky with these estimates. So this is not the way prior posterior plots are supposed to look like. And that's why I, all, why I always encourage you to have a deeper look at diagnostics. So you have all those plots, you have the mode check plots, which would immediately show you if a parameter is not identified. You have the identification tools that allow you to check for identification. You have convergence diagnostics that allow you to check whether this is convergence or not. Okay, so questions? Uh, what about the parameters, the posteriors that are very thin um, and are concentrated only in one value? Is that a problem also, or is that the estimate of the information is you uh, mean very good? Uh, if if it looks like more looks like this, if it's highly peaked. Yeah, but even even more. It can happen. If your data is really, really informative or you have a lot of data, sure. Why not? So it's not a problem. No, it's not like the algorithm is stacking one value or something like that. That can happen. So you should look, have a look at a trace plot. If you do it, if you, if you, let's see, oops, sorry, should be somewhere before the diagnostics. If you do a trace plot and you see that it's always looks like this. So it's a hard cutoff at the bottom. You have, then you obviously hit a bound. That would be a warning sign. If it's rather smooth around uh, this, uh, dense, uh, this peak, it's less of an issue. So usually you can, you can spot whether you're, you're getting stuck or not. Okay, okay, thank you very much. On slide 64, if something doesn't converge, what happens? Slide 64. 
Um, so one of the things that happens is that those two lines are not converging. So you have blue, the red line up here, the blue line down here, and they don't converge. That is one of the examples that can help. Uh, yeah, Thomas, uh, it, the thing here with Jesus is I'm pretty sure that he wasn't the one who did the work. So, and, and after all, it's not a top five paper. But over a beer, I could probably tell you more. I'm actually, not a, I'm not a beer drinker, so yeah. Okay, then we have a question. So, so usually when you run Dynair, the so question is, what do I need to save? Let's see. This I need to kill, and then I need to show you where's my MATLAB. And I need this one. So here you can see MATLAB. Usually when you run estimation, let's see, do I have an estimation result somewhere? Let's just go for the unstable version, take the examples. Let's say we do the smoother, we do Bayesian IRFs, and then we say Dynair FS2000. Uh, and you run this thing, then you will be getting all this output. Generally, it will save pretty much everything you need to know. And you could even load that. You can load previous runs with load MH file. I'll show you. So generally, pretty much everything that Dynair needs to know will be somewhere. So here, those are the Bayesian impulse responses. Oh, um, yeah, this one. Those are the Bayesian impulse responses. And what's now following is the smooth variables. They look like this. And smooth shocks. We don't care about the constants. So let's go here. Those are the smooth shocks. Smooth shocks means our best estimate of the shocks given the data. And what Dynair does, it saves all that stuff. In the FS2000, you have all the graphs. So this is the prior graph. You have within the Metropolis folder, the smooth values. You have within the output folder, the Bayesian IRFs. And within the prior folder, you have information on the prior. And then this FS2000 results here is going to store all the results. Of course, if you want to make your life easier, what you can always do is just say options dot tesh equal to one. And let's say we do collect LaTeX files. We'll quickly run this again. Maybe somewhat quickly. I hope it works as expected. So they would put plot all the graphs on the LaTeX file? It should put everything into one file. Let's see whether that works. But I can see Bayesian computations take time. OK, and now there's the Tesh file. Let's open that. 
and let's let's see to at least somewhat quickly compile it. Of course, that's going to take a bit because all those EPS files that were generated need to be converted to PDFs. But it's going to do that. And you can even have, have it output the posterior estimates and stuff like that. Let's wait a second. One more. One more round of compiling. I hope, actually hope that Frederick isn't going to be mad because we are a bit late. So it looks like this. Those, those are the inefficiency factors. This is a measure of the autocorrelation in the draws. Here are your Bayesian IRFs. Those are the smooth values. Here are the results from my uh, Metropolis Hastings for different stuff. I could have it output a prior table if I would like to. Here are the prior posterior plots. Here are the prior distributions. So pretty much everything's there. But yeah, generally you want to make sure before you run an estimation that you request all the output you would like to have. And here the manual is your friend. Does that answer the question? So someone said it would be great to have a Q&A session. When would that fit your schedule? And on the other Q&A session of the other, session, the other and on, right? I think there's not that many on Friday, but yeah. but um, I mean, we learned a lot too. So. so as you wish. So if you want to talk about anything, for example, also the exercise, we can try to schedule something. We can, for example, also we use Mattermost to coordinate it, something. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, I have a question on slide four, please. Slide number four. Slide number four. So yes, please. Yeah. Uh, you said in the uh, point uh, five point five point uh, the fifth point. You said that yeah. generate historical decomposition. Yes. Can you do you have an example of uh, historical decomposition with the dates? how to put the date on the historical decomposition, please. Uh, you mean with the dates command? Uh, if you are, we have a historical decomposition, we put the date on the X axis. Is yeah. it possible? It is possible. Mm, I guess that, so when you go to GitHub, Dynair has this, mm -hmm. has this tests folder. They pretty much find examples for everything. I have to check. Okay, okay. Let's say we use. We have a look at this one. So this doesn't do it. This is the mat file. That's also not what we want. So there must be an example somewhere where actually a D series object is used. Have to look that up. If you search the forum, I know that there is a question like this. So okay. Okay. You can also repost the question at Mattermost and we will answer it there. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. So the Thank historical decomposition are stored in, in the results in one of the matrices on MATLAB. So you can plot anything you want on MATLAB with the date and like- Yeah, yeah. but here yeah, it's about, have, yeah. So those are the two answers on the forum. You can either do the, the graph yourself or you have to use a D-series object to get this. Okay, okay. okay. And if you have okay, options you. replic and compute the stuff from a previous estimation, there is this load mh file option. Have a look at the manual. Okay, so thanks for your attention. And have a nice rest for summer school. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. You too. Thank, Thank you. you so much, yeah. Professor. Bye-bye.